All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Network 2020's discussion about the evolution of ISIS. Um, for those who are joining us for the first time, um, and welcome to everyone, um, just a little bit of background about Network 2020. So we are a New York City-based nonprofit, and we really try to provide leading access to leading thinkers and doers in the international affairs space for our, our audiences in New York and around the world. Um, and we're really trying to create more nuanced conversations about global affairs um, for, um, for everyone. So it is a pleasure to introduce our speakers and moderator for today's talk. Um, first, I would like to welcome um, Michael Collins. He is the executive director for the Americas at the Institute for Economics and Peace, where he oversees a number of initiatives that help develop metrics that are used to analyze peace and quantify its economic value. And IEP also recently published their Global Terrorism Index for 2024. Um, next, we have Dr. Kim Cragen, uh, who is the director of the National Defense University's Center for Strategic Research, where she is a distinguished fellow for counterterrorism. And there she oversees over two dozen annual studies for the senior leaders in the Joint Staff, the Office of uh, the Secretary of Defense and Combatant Commands. And she is an internationally recognized expert on foreign fighters and violent extremism. And lastly, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Esfendiar Mir, who is a senior expert in the South Asia program at the U.S. Institute of Peace. His work includes research on U.S. counterterrorism policy and political violence with a regional focus on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and moderating today's conversation, we have Joanna Vashevsky, who is a senior advisor at Network 2020, uh, who has a doctorate in, from Oxford in international relations. Um, so we're so pleased to welcome everyone. And with that, I will turn it over to Joanna. Great. Thank you so much, Courtney. The ISIS attacks on the Crocus City Hall Theater in Moscow this past March appeared to refocus global attention on the ongoing threat from Islamic jihadism including the Islamic State or ISIS. While the ISIS caliphate in Syria and Iraq has ceased to exist in 2019, its affiliates around the world have continued acts of terrorism through various forms of asymmetric warfare. In addition, such groups have used the conflict in Gaza as a recruiting tool for new jihadists and to spread their propaganda and visibility among disgruntled populations. U.S. national security officials, such as U.S. Central Command Commander General Eric Carrilla and FBI Director Christopher Wray, have been emphasizing over the past year about the heightened risk of an attack from ISIS with little or no warning. In addition, Christine Abizade, the outgoing director of the National Counterterrorism Center, warned of the elevated global threat environment coming from these energized jihadist groups. So what is the current status of ISIS globally? What are its objectives and how is it pursuing them? What role does ISIS Khorasan or ISIS-K, the affiliate that conducted the Moscow attacks, play within ISIS? What is the Biden administration doing to counter the threat and how successful have its policies been? Are we likely to see ISIS as a growing threat or one that can be contained? I look forward to discussing these and other questions with our panelists today. And just a reminder that if you have any questions during the discussion, to please put them in the Q&A box, and I will get to them after the discussion. So let me begin first with you, Kim, to kind of be the scene setter. Could you please talk, talk about who is ISIS and how the Biden administration is confronting the threat from jihadism? Great. Thanks, Joanna. And I guess let me start with my usual disclosure or caveat that although I work for the National Defense University and so I'm a federal employee, everything I say is my own view and I'm not speaking for the U.S. government or the Department of Defense. Okay, so beginning with the overview of ISIS, the full name is Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Some also refer to it as Daesh and others just say the Islamic State. It has its roots in Al-Qaeda and it emerged onto the world stage in July 2014 um, after it essentially chased Iraqi security forces out of Mosul. And its then leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, um, stood at a lectern in the city central mosque and announced the creation of a new Islamic state. Um, ISIS eventually ruled over 11 million people in Iraq and Syria, and foreign fighters poured into ISIS-controlled territory upwards of about 40,000. Um, they were very much involved in attacks against the West, and 
ISIS orchestrated over 250 attacks against the West during the height of its power between the July 2014 and March 2019. At that time, the U.S. mobilized against ISIS, actually not really until um, there were attacks in Paris in November 2015. Um, but unlike the efforts in Afghanistan or the surge in Iraq, there were only hundreds um, or maybe low thousands of U.S. troops that were deployed. And instead, the United States sent small numbers of military advisors who supported the Iraqi security forces and the Kurds, also known as the SDF, um, with close air support. By March 2019, ISIS had lost control of all of its territory or most of its territory in these two countries. So this brings me to Biden's current policy and the current administration's policy and how it differs from in the past. But before I answer that, and you alluded to this, I think it's important to stress that ISIS and Al-Qaeda have not actually disappeared. And ISIS has branches in places like Central Asia and the Middle East, and I know other people are going to talk about those. It also has about 5,000 fighters in Syria and Iraq, and about another 9,000 in the SDF detention facilities that we are subsidizing and, and helping SDF maintain. The current approach to ISIS and really all counterterrorism, so not just ISIS, is called over the horizon. And that is US forces are postured outside a conflict zone. And then when intelligence identifies a threat, those forces cross international borders to execute an airstrike or a drone strike against that threat or that plot. The rationale of this in the national security strategy is that the US is competing with Russia and China. Um, those countries are trying to reshape the world order. We're trying to prevent that. And so we need to be shifting resources away from counterterrorism and towards strategic competition. This doesn't mean that we're ignoring ISIS. And as you mentioned, General Carrillo just testified before Congress, and he stated that we've done 45 airstrikes against ISIS in 2023. And these plus the ground operations by the Iraqis and the Kurds has really kept enough pressure on ISIS so that it hasn't been growing um, and resuming its, its posture against us, at least out of Syria and Iraq. And that's not Afghanistan, which we'll talk about later. And also, and then, you know, you asked me to talk about Gaza, so I'll talk about it a little bit and say that the conflict in Gaza has a compounding effect. And that's what Christine Abzain was just referring to. Um, because that conflict is galvanizing ISIS supporters and Al-Qaeda, as well as Shia militias. Even as the US is reducing its resources away from counterterrorism. And in fact, in that same testimony by General Carrillo, what he said is even worse, the limited resources that he now has that used to be dedicated towards counterterrorism are being used for strikes, force protection strikes in Iraq and Syria, as well as against the Houthis in the Red Sea to defend the shipping. And so as a result of that reduced pressure on ISIS, it is starting to recover even in Syria and Iraq. So I'll stop there as a sort of scary scene setter and hand it off to the other panelists. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. So now if I can turn to you, Asfandiar, um, to go kind of zero in on a specific part of the world, what was the impact of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan on ISIS? And, and what are some of the U.S. counterterrorism policy options for the U.S. in Afghanistan? Um, Joanna, thank you for having me. Thank you uh, to Network 2020 for uh, convening this conversation. And I'm uh, I'm honored to be on the panel with with both Michael and and Kim. Um, so you know, as we think about um, post withdrawal Afghanistan, I think an important starting point is the recognition that the structural environment uh, that Afghanistan offers is very conducive for a range of different terrorist groups, uh, groups uh, of different ideologies. Um, have opportunities for regrouping, plotting, um, and collaborating with one another. Uh, and these groups are also positioned to tap into uh, what I believe is a vast pool of trained militant personnel, uh, many of whom have been trained by the Taliban themselves for their uh, war against the United States and the former Afghan government. Uh, and to some extent, uh, we also find a similar pool, pool of personnel across the border from Afghanistan in, in Pakistan. Uh, 
the groups moreover benefit from the reduced US monitoring um, and you know other associated platforms that existed uh, while the United States was was present in the country. So this is kind of, you know, these are the, some of the structural features uh, of uh, of today's Afghanistan in 2024 and its uh, surrounding environs. Uh, and this structural uh, environment has had a spill, spillover. Terrorist groups are not only operating from inside Afghanistan, but increasingly operating across the borders of Afghanistan from Central Asia, as well as Pakistan, which in turn is adding to the terror threat, uh, certainly to the regional countries, but also increasingly beyond those, uh, the, the immediate neighbor, neighborhood and region of, of Afghanistan. And in this environment, um, ISIS has, has really asserted itself and specifically a branch of ISIS that you referred to earlier, ISIS Khorasan, ISIS K, we, we, we like to call it ISIS K here in Washington. It has presented, a rising threat with reach, uh, not just in the neighborhood, in the region, but beyond. Um, and I would benchmark it. it the, the level of threat is now greater than it was in the pre-withdrawal uh, period. Uh, and this threat of ISIS-K is certainly rooted in Afghanistan, but it, it is also being channeled out of Central Asia and then parts of, uh, of Pakistan. So what is uh, driving this threat? Uh, and, you know, as I mentioned, uh, ISIS, much like other terror groups um, in, in the region, is benefiting from reduced U.S. CT monitoring. Um, there is also the factor of inspiration. The Taliban's uh, victory uh, in Afghanistan was certainly an iconic uh, a moment, and all jihadist groups have, uh, have drawn uh, great inspiration. From, from that particular feat. Uh, but then, you know, the other sort of more surprising dimension uh, of, uh, of the threat is, or kind of what drives ISIS-K's threat is its competition with the Taliban. Uh, ISIS in general, and then ISIS-K, which is the Afghanistan-specific branch, it is a hyper-competitive uh, group. So not only is it sort of um, is, is it high on zealotry, but also high, you know, this sense of competition. Uh, and with that sense of competition, it really opposes the Taliban and seeks to distinguish itself from Taliban or other jihadists who are more confined or limited in their ambitions. Uh, and this sense of competition really pushes or is a source of impetus for ISIS, ISIS Khorasan specifically to strike in the wider region and then attempt attacks beyond the region in parts of Europe. Uh, and I would, I would contend um, they certainly have the ambition to strike uh, in the United States uh, as well. So, so that's the sort of the threat picture kind of where Afghanistan or, uh, you know, I, Afghanistan fits in in ISIS's plans and calculus and political ambitions. Um, I think the U.S. government um, is, uh, is, uh, is seeing three buckets of options to deal with this particular challenge. Um, and the first bucket, uh, I think there's been uh, some conversation on this, um, uh, you know, in, in the public, involved working with regional countries to monitor and try to stop the threat, contain the, the, the threat uh, in Afghanistan or in its uh, immediate neighborhood. Um, that is, it's a workable solution, but it's also pretty tough. Uh, the United States doesn't have... Uh, a relationship with Iran at all, so which is a key critical neighbor of, of Afghanistan. Then the, the U.S. has had a complicated relationship with Pakistan, another key neighbor of Afghanistan, and the, the counterterrorism relationship with Pakistan, uh, which was at one point very deep, it has atrophied. Uh, and then in Central Asia, there are some real limits as well. Um, there's a lot of Russian influence in Central Asia. Uh, so, so that can come in the way of counterterrorism cooperation. The second option, on the other hand, uh, involves going beyond the region and trying to, you know, get the Taliban to go after ISIS Khorasan and, and in turn neutralize the threat. And this makes sense because uh, the Taliban are the government of Afghanistan. And if ISIS is coming out of uh, Afghanistan, then, then the Taliban can most likely do the most, at least more than, than many others in the region. 
Uh, and I think there are two sort of um, options here. You could try to pressure the Taliban, shame the Taliban into doing more on ISIS, uh, ISIS-K. And that gets us into the question of, okay, how, where is leverage and how do you shame the, the Taliban into, into better CT behavior? Or alternatively, and this is controversial, you can provide material assistance to the Taliban, uh, including potentially intelligence. And this is, uh, I imagine, deeply unpalatable to, to many people in the, in the U.S. national security apparatus and then, of course, the, the broader public. Uh, and 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 so it's it's a difficult option. The final uh, option involves, uh, you know, similar to what Kim was referring to in the in the context of Iraq and Syria, military action by the United States itself. Uh, we have not seen a lot of direct action uh, by uh, the U.S. government in Afghanistan since the U.S. withdrawal. We we've seen one strike against the leader of Al Qaeda. In downtown Kabul, the Taliban were hosting him, and 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 that's a, that's a very problematic sort of fact in of itself. But setting that aside, uh, I think uh, you know U.S. policymakers could consider military action against uh, top ISIS ISIS uh, targets, uh, in particular those who were engaged in transnational plotting um, that we are seeing uh, in say parts of Europe. I'll stop there. Thank you. Yes. So Afghanistan continues to be a com very complex challenge um, for the United States, for sure. So now turning to you, Michael, to kind of now look more at the big picture about terrorism. Um, your organization recently published the Global Terrorism Index for 2024. What were its main findings and about ISIS specifically? Sure, sure, Joanna. Um, so, so the the um, the Global Terrorism Index, what it essentially does is it sort of provides a a global count, I suppose you could say, of terrorist uh, incidents and uh, and deaths uh, um, and injuries uh, and even kidnappings from from terrorist groups, and kind of sort of compiles that and sort of looks at it in terms of overall trends, but also in terms of the longer term sort of uh, socioeconomic impact that terrorism has around ha has around the world. I mean, one of the interesting things is that when you sort of look into the large scheme of things, terrorism in terms of overall deaths actually accounts for, you know, very, very relatively few deaths worldwide compared to conflict and compared to, to homicide and even even suicide around the world, for example. But it has a deep, you know, social and emotional impact, right, in terms of every uh, individual attack. And it's kind of sort of designed in that way. It's, it's designed to create fear, designed to create um, panic. I think, you know, to Asfandiar's point, I think potentially one of the reasons why why some of the, the red flags are being missed is because, you know, in terms of, of terrorism in the West specifically, we have been seeing sort of improvements in levels of terrorism essentially for the last 15 years, right? Primarily, most of the most recent attacks that we've seen in, in the West have been politically driven, um, you know, whether it be kind of extreme left or extreme or extreme right, rather than sort of religious, uh, religious driven or religious, uh, religious extremism driven, such as is the case of uh, as, as the Islamic uh, state. You know, there was a sort of a um, other than than Moscow, uh, of course, which which we wouldn't directly throw in the in the West bucket in this particular instance. There was a, an attack killing two people back in 2022, I believe. Um, but since then, there hasn't been been much. And a lot of the attention has kind of sort of turned uh, internally. Uh, I do concur with the group, though, that the Islamic State continues to represent a, um, a significant uh, threat. In fact, it continues to be the most deadly group worldwide as of as of today. Uh, we have seen sort of the growth of other terrorist groups, including uh, Jenny and the Sahel, for example. Um, but but um, the Islamic State continues to be one of the, uh, the, the core actors. Overall, in terms of, of terrorism, we have seen it uh, recently over the last year deteriorate globally and that does come off however sort of on, on a you know three or four years but progressive years of improvement uh in terrorism since you know many of the of the sort of the the harsh counterterrorism uh, uh programs put in put into place that have led to to significant uh reduction of terrorism in places like Iraq for example although I think it was uh, originally to to Kim's point um, that ISIS is, um, or, or the Islamic State is, is regrouping significantly uh, in Syria. Uh, and of course, there's always a danger that they would expand from there into Iraq again, should the opportunity uh, arise. But, you know, one of the things that we've noted in the Global Terrorism uh, Index specifically is this transition from terrorism. Number one, terrorism has become a lot more concentrated in a fewer number of countries. Um, so there were more deaths overall globally, but less incidents. Basically, terrorism is becoming more lethal. 
um, going from you know uh, from one and a half deaths per attack to two and a half deaths per per attack uh, globally. Um, and the Islamic State is becoming lethal in many ways as well. So it has sort of transitioned, as has the whole of terrorism, essentially, from sort of the MENA region to sub-Saharan Africa, obviously with, with the exception of the major Hamas attack in, in Israel. Um, but more people died in Burkina Faso, for example, last year than they, than they, than they did through the Hamas uh, attack. So Burkina Faso has become very much the epicenter of terrorism from a country, from a regional perspective, the Sahel, um, and then sub-Saharan uh, Africa more broadly, all the way down to sort of Mozambique. And the Islamic State is a core, core player in all of those overall conflicts. So the Islamic State of, of West Africa just being one of them. Now, you know, uh, the Khorasan uh, chapter is kind of sort of off to the right there, uh, of course, to a certain extent. But all of these kind of sort of, you know, affiliates intermingle with 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 each other and and um, and coordinate to a degree. Um, so, again, I very much concur with the group um, that, that the Islamic State continues to be a significant threat. Um, in the report this year, we did leverage some of the sort of the new technologies around AI and machine learning to be able to sort of um, provide an estimate. A lot of the attacks worldwide are more uh, left unclaimed these days, um, you know, potentially because it's too small and maybe an embarrassment for the group or alternatively too big um, and may elicit certain repercussions that, they, that they're not looking for. Um, but by using machine learning, we'd be able to, to kind of sort of, you know, do our, our best estimate of what of how many of these unclaimed attacks are potentially from the Islamic State as well, and that would essentially increase the amount of uh, of um, Islamic State uh, attacks by by sixty percent in all of these countries. So the Islamic State, um, in terms of of Islamic State proper and its broader affiliates, are acting in, in over twenty countries today. It's a lot. Um, it is less than, you know, back in 2014 when they were active, in, sorry, uh, well, 2018, I should say, uh, when they were active in more countries. Um, historically, they've been active in over 40 countries around the world. So it just speaks again to kind of sort of the potential footprint that they can uh, that they can have. Um, and again, I mean, the, the potential opportunity that exists around a singular attack, such as the one that we saw recently in, in Moscow, are very much applicable here in the United States as well. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to turn to you, Kim, it's something you had just briefly mentioned about the war in Gaza. You know, how has it um, impacted uh, ISIS and also U.S. counterterrorism policy? Yeah, I think we're going to learn more and things are going to evolve as this conflict continues, although hopefully there will be a ceasefire um, <laughs> on again, off again, right? Um, nevertheless, I think that as happens sometimes, the Hamas attack, I guess just briefly, right? So Hamas um, did a barrage of missile attacks into Israel, and this hid or provided cover for teams to infiltrate into Israel, and they kidnapped um, a number of people and killed a number of people. I, I, the numbers off the top of my head are, are um 1,400 were killed and around, we didn't know exactly, but over 250 were kidnapped, right? So this was the, um, and this just sends shock waves across the counterterrorism community, both the audacity of the attack and then how it started to galvanize and motivate what the counterterrorism community calls lone actors um, or individuals who are don't seem to be tied to a terrorist group specifically. Probably um, they might be um, in, in very loose sort of social media senses, but not actually in a command and control sense. And these individuals are, are, are motivating. In fact, there was an arrest in April in Germany of um, a handful of teenagers, I think four or five. And um, they, they, they discovered they were plotting because one of them, a girl, a young girl, was planning to go and join ISIS and leave and become a foreign fighter. So these sorts of um, attacks were galvanized by the conflict um, in Gaza. All right, so US counterterrorism then as a result, you've got sort of twofold, how we're responding to Gaza. And like I mentioned, this is trying to stop the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. This is um, whatever support that we're providing to Israel. Um, and then at the same time with limited resources, continue to monitor um, and potentially strike threats against the homeland. And that's just a very complicated thing to do with limited resources. And 
So I think General Corolla, back to him, since we're reciting him, said within the next six months, we won't actually be able to see a plot coming out of Afghanistan. And so that's because you're seeing an attrition of our ability to continue to monitor things because we're focusing on the conflict in Gaza. That's just the reality of counterterrorism, sort of post-20, post withdrawal from Afghanistan, I would say 2021. Um, but but it's a it's a challenge. And again, why you see counterterrorism people sort of uh sounding the alarm. Yeah, no, I can imagine it's quite a daunting thought that you you know the threat is there, but the, you don't have the resources that you really need to be able to address that threat. Yeah. Right. Th well, thank you so much. And then, so now I'll turn to you, As Asfandiar. Um, you know, recent ISIS attacks and threats in Iran, Russia, and Europe have come from ISIS-K, and you you touched on ISIS-K briefly. You know, who is this faction, and and what role do they play in within ISIS? Sure. So. Um... So let me um, give some detail uh, on the, the the threat itself. Uh, what has the nature of the threat been, at least over the last twelve months? Um, several ISIS uh, uh, ISIS K plots um, against U.S. interests um, have been detected uh, in the in the in the last twelve month period. Um, uh, there have been arrests by Austrian, Dutch, uh, German authorities. There's a credible suggestion that those, those arrests have disrupted actual plots. Uh, in some cases, funding networks. There are other reports uh, from various parts of, of Europe of, of operatives um, or cells um, uh, being taken down. Uh, so there seems to be a pretty constant hum of um, of um, ISIS-K activity, um, and and these cells, uh, it you know it appears that they're a, a real mixed bag in terms of how they are uh, coming about. Uh, there is a possibility that um, some of these cells involve uh, people who have been trained in Afghanistan uh, before being sent overseas to undertake attacks, but but that's kind of the more traditional model of external attack plotting. What we're now seeing, uh, you know, in particular from ISIS-K, uh, is uh, enablement, uh, connecting operatives, uh, say, who are based in the region with online supporters uh, who are then provided direction, instruction, and perhaps some kind of funding as well. And so ISIS-K uh, is, uh, is, you know, one of the main units of ISIS, which is able to pull off this kind of external attack or plotting activity um and and that is kind of what sets it um it apart um isis uh, khorasan takes a uh, political direction from isis iraq and syria there is evidence even in the open source uh, that there is a layered bureaucratic structure which connects uh, isis uh, in iraq and syria to isis khorasan we have seen the the us government us treasury in particular pinpoint some uh, some nodes uh, across the two organizations uh, which exchange money. Um, and so there have been financial flows from Iraq and Syria. Um, then ISIS Khorasan also works with other ISIS affiliates. So there are indications that uh, ISIS Khorasan has been directed um, or has been assisted by the ISIS affiliate in Somalia. Uh, and that uh, has triggered some U.S. military actions. Uh, the United States government um, uh, neutralized a, an ISIS Somalia leader named Bilal Sudani. Uh, I think it was last year um, uh, because he was, you know, he had helped assisted ISIS uh, Khorasan. And then there are other transnational linkages with the broader ISIS network. The suggestion, for example, of ISIS Khorasan receiving funds or or being in touch with, in contact with, say, ISIS element cells in a in a place like Maldives. Um, so in that sense, ISIS Khorasan is very much at the center of this sort of transnational layered, transnational network that ISIS uh, has globally uh, with connection, with material ties, with political ties. Um, and, 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 you know, and that's those connections, those networks, it appears are enabling it uh, to, to sort of play this role of being the vanguard uh, of ISIS's sort of ex external attack ambitions. 
Thank you. So do you think it's it's likely that that will continue, that its role will continue and grow? Look, I, I am not seeing uh, a lot of pressure on ISIS, um, K or ISIS Khorasan's external attack capabilities in the region for now. The Taliban are certainly fighting um, ISIS-K. I, I don't dispute that, but they are mostly going after parts of ISIS-K that are fighting them. So parts of ISIS-K which are engaged in an insurgency against the Taliban, the Taliban are very focused on that. Um, and then, you, you know, the, the skill or the art of taking down external attack capabilities um, you know, it requires some some very specific skills, which I don't see the Taliban possessing. For example, counterterrorist finance um, is is critical to effective counterterrorism against you know such external attack uh, infrastructures, and the Taliban are uh, are not doing much to beef up the, the counterterror finance infrastructure you know, of their uh, fledgling sort of Afghan state government. Uh, and, and I don't see them working with any sort of outside act, uh, not even, you know, one of their partners who might be assisting them with with improving uh, terror finance control. So, um, so my uh, assessment is that for a period of time, we will, uh, we will see this threat um, as growing. Um, and, uh, and I think we will need, I, I would have to see some real policy action either by the United States, by regional countries or multilaterally uh, to be convinced that uh, this threat is now being being checked. Thank you so much. And, and now I have one more question, um, but uh, before I turn to Q&A, so if you have any questions, please um, put it in that box. And this is for you, Michael. Based on your research, um, what specific concerns does ISIS raise in the Sahel region and other parts of the world? So, although it continues to be the, the, the deadliest organization, we have seen sort of a significant decrease in its activity overall, right, since the, since the heyday uh, of, of, of Iraq and, and Syria. So I think in that, in that sense, its capacity has definitely been, um, uh, definitely been impacted. But again, it still remains uh, the most deadly organization uh, worldwide. And the thing about sort of the, the Sahel um, is that we're seeing a number of things, obviously incredibly porous um, uh, borders, uh, institutions, national institutions, i.e. governments who are, you know, not able to 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 control many of the uh, the kind of sort of the, the rural regions. And therefore, uh, ISIS has the full ability to be able to kind of sort of, you know, move between uh, one one place and, uh, and another. Um, and even even you know the the efforts of you know in you know Operation Barkhane in, in the day as well as you know Wagner forces right now really have difficulty in being able to control uh, ISIS um, and of course a lot of these you know institutional forces um, uh, you know whether those be good or bad or or, or whatever the case may be uh, are also struggling bear in mind with a whole other bunch of terrorist groups in that particular region uh, as well so that adds complexity the problem is you know that that it is. It is very, um, it is very rooted, very mobile, um, and increasingly leveraging a lot of the the sort of the, the socioeconomic opportunities. I see sort of a question in the chat that we're more than happy to to try and address um, about the control of, of you know potentially illicit economies, including artisanal gold mines and so on and so forth. So there's significant opportunity for ISIS to be able to move around these places to be able to to fund their own their own operations. And although they're not seeing the amount of you know growth that you would have seen. Uh, uh, prior to their to their heyday, um, they you know still continue to be a, a significant force. In the case of of Afghanistan, I think it's very interesting dynamics. I don't fully understand them, uh, um, uh, as, uh, of course, as much as Asfandiar does. It's it's actually probably a question for Asfandiar. You know, we noted in in the index that the overall number sort of of attacks and deaths from the Khorasan chapter had deteriorated or had gone down um, over in 2023 compared to before. Um, and of course, you know, um, so, so the Islamic State would have been responsible for the attack, the Kabul airport uh, attack, as an example of that. So invariably, the Islamic State was fighting with, with the United States in Afghanistan, which would have contributed to the, the larger number of attacks the, the year before 2021 and 2022. But I just wonder if also the fact that the Taliban now has sort of full control 
of the, uh, or is the essentially, like you say, is from the, uh, the, the government in, in Afghanistan, whether it's simply, now that it doesn't have the distraction of the United States, whether that has increased, you know, organically, it's holistically, it's capacity to be able to address um, uh, or, or, or fight uh, the Khorasan chapter, even though it may not have a full uh, full counterterrorism strategy uh, in place. So we did see a sort of a slight improvement along those metrics, but even in the case of uh, of uh, the Khorasan chapter, uh, you know, continuing to be a considerable force. Great, thank you so much. And now, so looking at the questions from our um, participants, um, this question is for you, Kim. You mentioned the difficulty of the U.S. to monitor multiple terrorist threats at once. Do you think ISIS is seeking to restore its conventional power with a more standard army and territory? Would this make counterterrorism efforts easier or harder for the United States, considering its other priorities in national security? Such a good question. I saw that in the Q and A. I thought it was a good question. Um, so, so my view of ISIS, both ISIS in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere, is that control over territory is a necessary part of their almost identity as a group, um, that they want to control territory and rule territory. Does it necessarily have to be territory as big as, you know, the state of Oregon? No, right? And so historically, ISIS and Al-Qaeda have taken control of small cities and, and ruled the city or the surrounding territory um, sort of in a de facto way. Um, you see this in in places we've seen it historically in Yemen um, and, and even currently, and you see it in places like Somalia. So it doesn't have to be as dramatic as we saw in Syria and Iraq. Um, the harder question to me is, does this make it harder or easier for the United States? Because this blends a little bit into sort of politics and what the United States is willing to take on and not take on. Right. As Michael has been talking about, the Islamic State and other terrorist groups have a lot of activity in Africa, different parts of Africa, where we're not directly involved in it. Um, and so there's this line on when do policymakers feel the need to get involved, right? So with Syria and Iraq, it was actually after there were attacks in Paris that the United States really actively got involved. So I think that um, the control over the territory is, is easy is easier for us to solve if there is an attack against the West um, because it galvanizes and it motivates the American people as well as American policymakers and rises it, it raises it to a level where we have to do something. Um, when there's control over the territory and the attacks aren't against us in the United States or against our strong allies, um, in Western Europe, I, I think it's it's harder to do something because it requires a significant number of forces, a significant number of airstrikes, and a lot of resources. And so I think that's the trade-off is it depends on if it's not just the control over territory, but what they're using the territory to do. And if they are using the territory to sponsor or enable attacks against us, then it is a little bit easier to have a defined territory and to do something about it, but it takes a higher level of forces to do that. Um, and, 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 and motivation and political will. Um, so I'll just end there. Great, thank you so much. And now a question for you, Asfandiar, um, is also in the Q&A box here. Do you personally view limited cooperation with the Taliban as necessary or even possible to countering the threat from ISIS-K, what impact would this have on the Taliban's global standing and acceptance? So my uh, colleagues uh, uh, and I have been thinking about this uh, particular issue and uh, at the US Institute of Peace, we uh, launched uh, a report, a special report on the counterterrorism situation very recently, which um, addresses uh, the question of, you know, what is the right policy approach toward the Taliban to address the, the counterterrorism challenge? Um, and the the conclusion we, we reached was that communication channels with the Taliban are pragmatic uh, and should be sustained and perhaps can even be uh, broadened uh, out. Um, and um, you know, I, we understand the concern that comes 
uh, with, uh, uh, with, with normalization. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, this is now in the public domain. The U.S. government has maintained channels uh, with uh, the, the Taliban on counterterrorism issues over the last few years since the, the, the U.S. Uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. So it is not necessary that these kinds of channels uh, in which it, concerns are relayed, expectations are laid out, um, and there is uh, a modicum of coordination uh, with the Taliban, uh, you know, that that will translate into d diplomatic normalization uh, of the Taliban. I think the U.S. government uh, can pursue its counterterrorism interests, uh, um, you know, by maintaining such channels uh, and, and without uh, sort of, you know, bringing the Taliban uh, in the in the diplomatic mainstream. Thank you. Um, now a question for you, Michael. How has the incidence of religious extremist lone actor attacks in the West changed in recent years? Do we see a consistent decrease in the lone actor attacks amid the overall decrease in terror attacks you mentioned? Um, so, I mean, I think probably the first thing to say in terms of, of, of religious attacks and probably why why they've kind of sort of captured the ascent, the, the attention so much is because for the most part, at least historically in the West, they've definitely been the most lethal, right? They're, they're, they're the largest attacks that we have seen, except, of course, the instances of sort of mass mass shootings uh, um, uh, in, in, the, in the United States. The the lone the lone actor uh, attack uh, attacks question is is kind of difficult. We don't disaggregate necessarily in the global terrorism as to whether it was a lone uh, a lone actor, alternatively a group. I mean, a lot of these instances are even if it is a single perpetrator, um, you know, are either tied to a specific uh, ideology, uh, whether that could be extreme right or extreme uh, uh, left, and therefore sort of grouped under that that banner. Uh, or alternatively, um, you know, claiming affiliation to a group like the Islamic State, or alternatively, perhaps being perpetrated on their own, being inspired enough by one of these groups to then be claimed. So, for example, that attack that I mentioned in Europe back in 2022, which um, I think um, was was the killing of, of um, a couple of taxi drivers, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um, probably in all likelihood, was a lone actor uh, inspired by the Islamic State, and that was then uh, claimed by the Islamic State as one of their attacks. That is quite common uh, as well, as well as what I mentioned before, the opposite, which is a lot of these attacks being perpetrated by, um, uh, you know, being left unclaimed. I think one of the real challenging things here, um, just focusing out a bit more broadly, uh, globally again, is the fact that so many of these groups um, kind of sort of merge and, and change. Um, so although you could potentially sort of pinpoint it uh, a bit more in the West with regards to responsibility from, from specific groups, um, terrorism in the West accounts for a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of, of terrorism uh, around, around the world um, in that sense. Um, so no, it is, it is you know, I, I think that, that probably organization, I do think, and this is conjecture on my part, that a lot more attacks in the West are perpetrated by the likes of, lo of lone actors, not only for religious purposes, but also for, for ideological and political ones um, than you would see in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and the Sahel because of the facilities um, that these groups have to operate as an organized group in these locations rather than in the United States where they would always be forced to operate in smaller and smaller groups. Great. Thank you. And now there's a question. It, it could be for any one of you. Um, if there's an is there an opportunity to negotiate? Does ISIS and Al Qaeda have a leader who speaks and has control of the group, or are there independent groups in different countries? Who would like to try that? Um, I can perhaps just jump on very quickly, sort of just mm -hmm. just just building off sort of my last um, comments on that, you know, again, the challenge is, is half the time you don't know who's who, who's leading, right? I think it's currently al Qurashi, if I'm not mistaken, for the Islamic State. In all honesty, I don't even know who the head of the of the of, the, of Al Qaeda currently currently is. Um, oftentimes, um, they change and chop. And of course, oftentimes, all of these internal leaders are also fighting each other. So just because you're take, getting the, you know, the official head of the Islamic State at any particular uh, point 
um, there are a lot of discrepancies, you know, and in internal different differing ideologies between the affiliates and the provinces as well. So, you know, I think that you're not necessarily, you know, negotiating with the whole of the Islamic State um, by negotiating with Al Qurashi. Um, you may see, you know, perfect discrepancies between what what the Khorasan chapter would be doing or alternatively ISIS West Africa. But uh, I think the rest of the group is a lot more qualified to answer. Hi. I, I can come in on on this uh, question. I you know I, I teach civil war, political violence, um, and uh, um, you know I, I try to tell my uh, or, you know teach my students that negotiations, uh, political options are in fact a um, you know a key part of the policy tool set that a lot of countries use rely to manage internal security uh, non-state threats and but. You know, uh, I think Al Qaeda and ISIS are um, are uh, different, and uh, we have normatively sort of made a determination that that, that that's not a path uh, that we'd like to pursue, and these are these are bad actors, and we, you know, there's, there's certain red lines we're going to to draw uh, when it comes to uh, to you know sort of political options with respect to these actors that being said i you know just for for the record i want to note that that the taliban uh, at least to the extent of the region have been offering to arrange negotiations between various terrorist groups that they are friendly with that they are providing uh, a haven for a sanctuary to and and regional government so they helped arrange a negotiation between um, um, a group called the Tehreek e Taliban Pakistan. It's an anti Pakistan terror group which has been fighting the Pakistanis for the last 15 years, has killed tens of thousands of Pakistani civilians and security forces personnel. And, and, and the Taliban are very friendly with this group. The Taliban arranged for a negotiation between Pakistan and this group. It ultimately collapsed, and the Taliban are keen on reviving that. But, but that's one thing they've done. The Taliban have also reportedly uh, arranged a conversation between the the, the Tajik government and uh, some uh, anti-Tajikistan jihadis that are based out of uh, out of Afghanistan. Uh, and while the Taliban have never explicitly offered to arrange a negotiation between uh, between say Al Qaeda and the and the United States, um, it is not implausible that that you know that would be something that that you know, that they that they may offer, but but certainly no, no one has ever raised that with them, and and I don't think that that would be a particularly good idea. Thank you. Actually, Joanne, just let me pile yes. on and say, you know, the U.S. has had this long-standing policy of not negotiating with terrorists, and it goes back decades. And um, there has been a little bit of wiggle room on political hostages, as we've seen with with Russia. Um, but um, I don't see that changing, but that does not preclude local, the countries where the terrorist group are actually operating to negotiate with them. And as been alluded to, it's not uncommon for the countries um, where the conflict is actually taking place to engage with the terrorists and to negotiate with them and to try and erode um, support for them by acquiescing on some areas. And so I think that's, those are two different things. And so I would split the question off in that way. Great, thank you for that clarification. And I'll stay with you, Kim. Um, are there regional actors such as Saudi Arabia or, or Qatar who could assist the U.S. in combating ISIS? Um, and in, in what way? I mean, we've seen um, U.S. presence in the Sahel decreasing, right? But um, in the Middle East, what could be done? Sure, actually we have, um, over the past 20 years, there are very robust partnerships with a lot of countries. Um, both in North Africa and in the Middle East and in the MENA region, actually. And then, of course, as was mentioned, on and off again with Pakistan as well on, on counterterrorism in Southeast Asia. And these have developed over time. Um, and they range from counter threat financing, which has been alluded to, um, all the way to um, the countries actually engaging in the conflict or arresting individuals. Um, because of arrest warrants. Um, and this is actually a, a good news story, despite all the, the bad news stories that I've been saying about um, the kinetic, uh, the military option for counterterrorism. My view is the law enforcement um, 
the law enforcement finish, as the counterterrorism community would say, but the arrest option or the law enforcement instruments that are used continue to be robust. And that's why you see some of these disruptions taking place um, in Western Europe. And in fact, if you believe the open source press, um, the United States even warned Russia and Iran about the ISIS attacks that were going to take place in those countries. And so, um, you know, the, the if you broaden cooperation to be intelligence sharing, counter threat financing, and um, law enforcement, then um, a vast majority of the countries in the MENA region have been cooperating with the United States, even if it's not as overt as um, you you might think. But yeah, I mean, Qatar, UAE, Saudi Arabia, um, you know, those are just a few, but even, um, you know, even countries like, of course, Egypt continues to cooperate with the United States and, of course, Tunisia on and off again, too. So I think it's a it's a pretty robust, good news story um, in the counterterrorism of the past 20 years. Just to, just to add to that very yep. quickly, Kim, uh, here at the uh, at the United Nations, uh, Qatar uh, and Saudi Arabia, for example, are key funders of all of the, you know, UNOCT Office of Counterterrorism efforts, you know, so it kind of sort of speaks to their you know, to their eye and their commitment to this. Okay, thank you very much. Now, this question, I think um, this is for you, Asfandera, but of course, others, please feel free to jump in. The, the person is asking, I wonder whether there would be a, re a vengeance jihad into the heart of Russia owing, owing to Russia's actions in Afghanistan in the 80s, Chechnya in the 90s and 2000s in Syria. Uh, that that's an interesting question, and you know when ISIS uh, ISIS case struck in Moscow in March, uh, people were a little sort of bewildered as to you know why 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 Russia, um, and and so ISIS um, in its uh, propaganda since the attack, ISIS K in particular, um, you know in its messaging, um, has referred to. Um, Russian support for the Assad regime, um, but um, the way they had they frame that the you know the Russian support for Assad regime in the in the logic they offer for for, for the for the Moscow attack, um, it doesn't seem like it it is it's the main reason why they the chose decided to to hit Russia, and it it appears to me that. Um, demonstrating geographic reach was a more important sort of motivator for um, ISIS-K um, uh, that, you know, that it was uh, willing and able, capable of punishing a so-called infidel regime like Russia, you know, in a, in a place as central as Moscow. I think that was sort of the main impetus as opposed to kind of what Russia did in, 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 in Iraq and Syria. Um, in terms of vengeance for what happened in the 1980s, uh, it is really interesting to see that the Taliban-Russia relationship has been blossoming and has improved quite a bit. There were reports uh, while the United States was in Afghanistan that there was something going on between Russia and the Taliban, that perhaps there was some kind of assistance, uh, but, you know, more suggestive, speculative. Now we see that the Russians are leaning forward in, uh, in you know, in helping the Taliban sort of diplomatically. And it seems like, the, you know, I think the, the Russian government is poised to remove Taliban from the list of their terrorist groups. And the Taliban, for their part, are very keen on developing out this uh, this this relationship with Russia. And, and they have certainly turned a page and um, they, uh, you know, uh, I see no signs of ill will or a desire for vengeance from the Russians. Um, you know, um, you know, among the Taliban, uh, they, they they seem to have moved on. Great, thank you so much. Well, in the remaining five minutes that we have, I wonder if we can. We have one final question um, for each of you, and I will start with you, Michael. First, what do you think is the most important factor to counter the ISIS threat, both in the short and long run? Um, 
You know, it's a really tough one. So one of the things that we sort of do in the Global Peace Index is we, sorry, the Global Terrorism Index, I should say, is we look at the the length of, um, you know, of existence of individual terrorist groups. The grand majority of terrorist groups don't last for, for more than one year, right? Either because they've been completely decapitated um, or alternatively they merge into, uh, you know, um, merge into another group or alternatively they they achieve their aims essentially um it's really really tough to weed out organizations that have been there um for for, for close to a for close to a decade right um and, and the Qadashan chapter i mean of course that that applies to the islamic state um but increasingly to the Qadashan chapter um yes um short short-term counter-terrorism measures are, are invariably successful um, but time and time again, we're in these situations in which we're providing that stabilization, providing that security, but doing very little on the sort of the, the development uh, uh, front to be able to address some of the underlying uh, grievances. I, I realize it's a very generic uh, statement, um, but it does very much sort of point to, to the need to realize, especially from a U.S. foreign policy perspective, that any form of, of intervention is never going to be a, a, a clean sweep. I don't know exactly where we are with regards to, you know, the full withdrawal of U.S. troops from Iraq and and, and so on and so forth. Um, but you know, ISIS is is just waiting to step across the step step across the the border, and any form of engagement like that is 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 something that you know we need to be aware is is you know twenty year thirty year uh, engagement. And you know, I'm not an expert on Afghanistan by by any means, and I do realize that we've been in Afghanistan already for a very very when I say we, I'm, I'm referring to the United States. Uh, for a very, very long time. Um, but again, I don't think anything was fundamentally changed, right? The approach was purely a, a security one. Um, yes, I'm sure that there was a whole lot of, you know, investment in, you know, aiming to strengthen the uh, the Afghan institutions, um, but perhaps still very much, you know, with a, with a security focus. Um, so, you know, more emphasis, or at least the realization that, um, that, that, that there should be an additional development focus, not, not only tacked on, to the end of a securitized response, but an essential part of it. Great, thank you. And Kim? I was hoping you were asking me a different question. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> me too. <laughs> you know, uh, we were talking earlier before we got online about the foreign affairs article by Michael Morrell, and he has this line in it that says that complacency is a greater risk than alarmism. Um, and I actually have kind of come to a, to that same point. I think that it's very easy to, to react to a big attack like the 9-11 attacks. And it's very hard to continue to just grind away at counterterrorism over time. Um, whether it's what Michael was talking about, which is sort of the social economic development and engagement or diplomatic engagement, which I was a big believer in 20 years ago and have gotten much more cynical over the past 20 years, and I tend to lean more towards the military or law enforcement finishes, but even the military and law enforcement finishes the persistent activity and having to do it over and over again, even if there isn't this huge threat to the United States, it's just very hard to do. So to me, the most important factor is avoiding that complacency and the persistence um, and 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 the need for that and continuing to devote resources to it even when it's not a crisis. Great, thank you. And and last but not least, Asfandiar. Sure. So so I'll make uh, two quick points here. One, um, I worry that the policy community, sort of writ large, and not just people who are in government, but many on the outside, um, are starting to see a trade off between strategic competition and CT and. And I agree that in the way CT was done over the last 20 years, indeed, there was the trade-off. If you open big counterterrorism wars in at least two countries, and then you're doing a lot of overseas counterterrorism in, in other parts of the, the world. So, so there was a trade-off, but uh, but now we're not. And, and I, I worry that uh, even, even at this stage, people think that some are doing more stepped up counterterrorism for vigilance sake is going to take us away from focusing on the the bigger priorities of of the day and and i i, I worry about that that sort of diagnosis or that sense that somehow uh doing more ct is bad for competing with with china and russia and then related to to that is kind of my second point and i think this point has become 
so you know uh, i think my thinking on this has crystallized since october 7th um uh, the the hamas attacks against israel which is this problem of the strategic vortex that uh that you know that mass casualty terrorism has the has the potential to to create to generate i think 911 in many ways did that attacks in europe uh, in the in the 2000s did that and we're now seeing after the october 7th attack which you know unleashed these societal forces uh, a lot of emotion um you know domestic political pathologies which are just very hard to control for decision makers uh, and the best way to avoid that is to actually be vigilant and to, and to do sort of proactive counterterrorism that so that we don't get caught up in these kinds of strategic vortexes which take us away from the strategic priorities of the day as well as you know compel policymakers to make sort of undesirable normatively um uh you know sort of uh, uh, bad normative choices uh so so i think with that i would um uh, yeah i would i would i would stop there right. well very appropriate way to end this fan, you know fantastic discussion it was so insightful and sobering at the same time but i wanted to thank uh kim aswandar and michael for a, a wonderful discussion and now courtney to you yeah, I'll, I will just echo Joanna. Uh, fascinating. A lot of great insights. I know we're over time. So um, I just want to say again, thank you, Kim, Asandia, or Michael. Um, it was a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Joanna, for moderating. And for all of you, we will continue to add some events over the summer. Um, it will just be at a slower pace as we um, you know, head into the summer months. But please do keep an eye out. And of course, we try to keep these conversations free and open to all. So we very much um, appreciate any support you can give. Um, we rely um, almost entirely on individual donations. So thank you very much. Um, have a great day, everybody.